A family talked mother into getting a hamster as long as they took care of the creature. Two months later, when mother was caring for Danny the hamster, she made some phone calls and found a new home for him. She broke the news to the children, and they took it quite well. But they did ha offer some comments. One of the children remarked, He's been around here for a long time. We will miss him. Mom agreed, saying yes, but he's too much work for one person. And since I'm the one person, I say he goes. Another child offered, well, maybe if he didn't eat so much and wouldn't be so messy, we could keep him. But Mom was firm. It's time to take Danny to his new home now, she insisted. Go and get the cage. With one voice and tearful outrage, the children shouted, Danny, we thought you said Daddy. <laughs> how many fathers do we have in here? Okay. How many of you have had a father? Okay. How many of you know fathers or ever knew a father? Okay. Just wanted to make... So here's what I want you to do. You know I've got to do this, so I'm going to get it out of the way. I turn to your left, say Happy Father's Day. Turn to your right, say Happy Father's Day. Look behind you, Happy Father's Day. Look in front of you, Happy Father's Day. You know I had to get that out of the way. We're kind of sparse this morning, I think. There's a lot of barbecues today. Um, we're kind of waiting till afterwards for my barbecue. I've been promised steaks today, so <laughs> I don't know if that means uh, brown steak or what. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I'm glad to see you here this morning. We're going to talk about what it means to be manly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tim the Tool Man Taylor. Remember that show? <laughs> Some of you are looking at me, what? Joshua chapter 1. If you would turn there, please, this morning. I understand some of you at Sunday school this morning had talked to, about a story in the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1 is where we're starting off this morning. We're going to look at some attributes this morning of a manly man. Joshua was one of those manly men or a godly man. A man that every man should be like. Let's be honest, though, it's more than just Joshua being a manly man. But quite frankly, it's what we all should be like. Man, woman, whatever. What it means to be a godly person. And so as we take a look at Joshua as an example of that this morning, I want you to look at some of these specific things that we find here in Scripture. Let's take a, look, take a look at Joshua chapter 1, starting with the very first verse of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 1. We see that God expected Joshua to be prepared. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, who had served Moses. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all of the people prepared to cross over to Jordan to the land I am giving the Israelites. I have given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness and Lebanon to the great Euphrates River, all the land of the Hittites and west of the Mediterranean Sea. 
No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or forsake you. The story of Joshua, uh, I, I really love the story. I, it's just a, an amazing story of a man who really had to go through a lot under the tutelage of Moses. And if you look at the story of Moses, uh, poor guy, uh, he had to deal with a, a bunch of people that liked to whine. I don't know anything about that. Uh, but he is a, a fellow who really had to deal with a lot. But his second, his second in command, really, is, is well, later on would be Joshua. And Joshua tried to get the people of Israel. He, he tried to save them from a lot of heartache. Joshua was one of the seven who did some recon early on in the process. If you remember, the Israelites were going to go into what we know of as the promised land, uh, Canaan, where the, the, the land where it was flowing with milk and honey. You remember the, the beautiful land, the land that they were going to go into and God was going to give them this land and eventually it was going to be the land that was going to be their home, that beautiful country. We know eventually that happened, but they had to wait a long time. Joshua, along with some other fellas, were going to do some reconnaissance. They went into this land. They kind of scouted it out, said, you know, we're going to see how bad it's going to be for us to go in and conquer it. Joshua, along with his one of his compadres there, Caleb, checked it out. And they said, you know what? It looks pretty rough. It, it looks like, you know, we're, we're going to go up against a, a tough army. But you know what? We can do it. Why? Because God said we can do it. So, yeah, let's do it. The other group in the recon, they said, you know what? It's going to be too hard. Let's not even try it. They came back to Moses and they said, uh, I don't think we can do it. Joshua and Caleb said, yeah, we can do it because God is going to go with us. So through this time of arguing back and forth, Moses and the rest of the people said, no, let's not do it. Because of their lack of faith, they found themselves wandering around in the wilderness until finally, after all these years, Moses passes on and now it's given over to Joshua. Joshua is the one that takes him into the wilderness. When he takes him into the wilderness, he now conquers the land under his authority, under his leadership. And God gives them this beautiful, beautiful land. <laughs> what a great story, huh? A, a story that I don't know why, you know, it, it, it hasn't been in the movies. I I think it would be a, a blockbuster film. I mean, we've had such great depictions of, uh, of these biblical movies re recently, like Noah. They've done such a great job with it. <clears throat> okay, maybe not. But you know what I'm saying. Just These blockbuster, I think it, this story of Joshua just would be amazing. I'm sure there'd be a lot of great blood and gore, and I don't know why it wouldn't be a rated R, and people would come see it. Anyway, here we have Joshua, who's ready to go into the land, lead the Israelites in to conquer this land. 
And God would give this land over to the people. But before he goes, he says, there's some things that you need to be ready for. There's some things that you need to keep in mind. And the first thing he tells them here is, you need to be prepared. God expected Joshua to be prepared. First of all, he says, for 40 years, God has been preparing him for this specific day. He was not just thrown into the fire, but God developed him as a leader. You see what he's developed him as? This military leader, but also a spiritual leader. See, that's just the same thing with Moses. Over all this time, Moses really didn't know anything about military leadership. He definitely didn't know much about spiritual leadership. But through this time, God began to develop him. And through that time, over 40 years, we saw where Moses was developing Joshua. So as he's developing Joshua, he's saying, now, during this 40 years, I'm preparing you to take over the reins and do what I need you to do. And so he's preparing him to go. And as he's preparing him with his faith, you notice where Joshua did not give any argument His faith has been the same since the day one when he came back from that recon mission and said, we can do it. But he had to wait 40 years to take the people into the promised land. So after 40 years, there's been no change. He said, we can do it. From the time Joshua scouted out the land, there was maturing even more in his faith to take on the responsibility. The second thing is, God told Joshua to observe his instructions. Look at verse 6. I love these words. He uses it over and over again. He says, be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to their fathers to give them as an inheritance. Above all, be strong and very courageous to carefully observe the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left so that you will have success wherever you go. I like that. That success wherever you go. During those years... Moses gave both Joshua and the Israelites specific instructions. He gave them instructions through the law, which included those Ten Commandments. You know what I'm talking about? You know, even if you haven't been to church, even if you haven't walked into a church building, you've heard at the words, the Ten Commandments. Even if you don't know the Ten Commandments, you're familiar with the concept of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not eat pork on Sundays. No? (laughs) It's amazing how many of those Ten Commandments have been changed over the years. But people get the idea, they have this concept of Ten Commandments. Um, So at least people have an idea that there are Ten Commands that they need to follow. So Moses received from God these Ten Commands, but then there's also all the other things that go along with it. He gave them ways to follow those commands. He gave them written accounts of past history. What are some of those past histories that Moses gave them? Or God, and God gave them through Moses. What about the book of Genesis? And some of those stories that were passed down through Moses. Things like that that God had given him. Those things were given to Joshua as well and to the Israelites. These are fascinating things that they they needed to have for him to pass down as well. He gave them instructions on how to follow God. And following Moses' instructions will lead to success in God's plans.
And we understand they will accomplish what God promised Moses. They will be given their own land. They will be given a, a gift without effort. Huh. If, if you look at the story that goes on later on that and, and throughout the book of Joshua, they basically walked into the land and did very little. Whenever they tried to do things on their own, it didn't work out too well, did it? They said, well, we're going to go do this ourselves because it worked out great for us last time. We think this is the best way to handle it. And it didn't work out. Matter of fact, there were a lot of deaths because of it. But when God was in control, it was simple. It was easy. What's the term? Easy peasy? They just went in and did it because God did it for them. So when God gave them these things, it was simple, not a problem. So the instructions that God gave them through Moses, he said, you need to listen to these instructions. You need to understand these instructions. You need to follow these instructions. But there's more than just following the instruction. God told Joshua to continually recite his instructions. Look at verse 8. This book of instructions must not depart from your mouth. You are to recite it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. One of the best ways to get information out in that day, especially in a people that were by the thousands and the thousands and the thousands was to recite the instructions. They, they didn't go around with uh, iPads and uh, share the information by email. They didn't go around texting it to each other. They didn't have the websites with the Ten Commandments on them. You couldn't download the app. Uh, they could not uh, pass out the latest version of the Hebrew to each other. So what they would do is they would take the scrolls and day and night they would read the law. And they would read the history. And they would read the instructions day in and day out. It's interesting because the best way to retain information is to hear it all the time. And the best way to understand it is to hear it all the time and to take it in. Would that mean you would get tired of hearing it? Well, maybe. But you wouldn't forget it, would you? Some of the greatest... Um, Stories are the stories that we always remember every detail. But some of the greatest or worst tragedies are the tragedies that we will always remember. Unfortunately, in our history, there are tragedies that we've had that we seem to forget over time. Some of you in post-World War II, there are some tragedies that you've experienced that I've never experienced. Um, some tragedies that you look back on that you may remember every detail, but it was never passed down to me, those details that it doesn't affect me. But then I think about stories like, or tra tragedies like 9-11. That was very tragic to me. That affected me greatly. And I remember the details about everything. And if you remember that particular tragedy, that was on every channel, 24 hours a day, for several days, seeing those images, that was probably one of the biggest tragedies that we saw in our uh, time, in our culture, that we had access to that. 
And because of that, it was ingrained in our thoughts all the time. We could, we could watch it on TV. We could hear it on the radio. We could pull it up on the internet. There was const- At that time, I remember there was constantly texts that were going out on our phones, on our emails, all this stuff, mass information coming out all the time. And there was constant updates on what was going on. And that information was hitting us all the time. And, and we were wanting more. We wanted more information. And the more information that came in, the more we remembered that. And we kept on saying we would never forget. And we needed to pass this information on to the next generation. Time went on. And those images began to fade. For many of us, those images are still clear. For some of us, we did move on. As we should. But the images started to fade. The next generation, they don't remember or they don't understand or they don't realize how bad it was. And we wouldn't expect them to because that tragedy wasn't as important to them. Because they don't see those images 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They don't hear the updates. They don't understand it's any different. They don't understand what it affected, how it affected us as a culture. You can't blame them for that. Because it's not coming in to them like it was. It's kind of what happened with the Israelites. It started out where God was saying to, through Moses, and then to Joshua, this instructions I'm giving to you, you need to hear it day in and day out. It needs to be written on your heart. This information needs to constantly be coming to you. And over time, we found out that that information began to fade. They, be, they quit giving that information out. And when they stopped giving the information out day in and day out, they began to forget and the more they began to forget the information, forget, forget giving this, getting this, um, the law and the, the history and all that, the more that the Israelites began to turn away from God. And the more they began to turn away from God, they forgot God altogether. They began to follow after other things. They began to follow after their own desires. And eventually they turned away from God so much that their whole life changed. As a matter of fact, the the nation of Israel itself was destroyed and the people were taken off and and some were were killed, some were were, uh, attacked and some were exiled to Babylon. And we know the story goes that after this great destruction of the people of Israel, as they were about to come back and God was going to give them this second chance, a copy of the law was found. And they realized where they had gone wrong. And they began again reading and reciting the law over and over and over again, day in and and day out. And the people began to come back to God. And as they began to come back to God, the nation of Israel began to rise up again. They began to to recover. When they heard these instructions, lives began to change. And as we find here, he says, recite these instructions again and again and again. It says, when everyone is on the same page, then everyone will have the same goal. When everyone knows God's word, then everyone will be encouraged. When everyone knows God's word, then everyone will be ready to follow Joshua with no compromise. He says, you need to be ready to give this information and everyone will be ready to follow because it will be God's word. And then finally, God told Joshua to trust his plans. Verse 9, 
Haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. (laughs) I think this is the most important part of this. Joshua was facing the unknown. He had a choice to fall back into the pattern of his ancestors or to go blindly forward. Because Joshua was willing to go God's direction, God would not leave him. God had a plan for Joshua and the Israelites. It's really hard to follow after a person. The Israelites had been following Moses. They didn't always agree with Moses. Matter of fact, Moses didn't always make the best choices. Sometimes he fell to uh, to his own pride. Sometimes he fell to uh, the uh, decision of the people. But Joshua decided, I'm going to go the direction that God wants me to go. And he never wavered. God told Joshua, if you follow my plan and be strong and courageous, follow that plan, I will be with you wherever you go. I think about that. And I think about what you and I go through. What does it mean to be a manly man. Does it mean to be a football player? Does it mean working for a mine? I uh, hope not because I could never do it. You guys who work for the mine, oh man, I could not imagine doing your job. Um, does it mean a certain job having a certain character here's what it means it means first of all prepare always prepare for God's call that's what it means to be a manly man just like Joshua had to prepare he prepared for 40 years to follow God's call Second of all, it said to be a manly man is to listen and obey his instructions. God is always giving us instructions. You know, we talked about this Wednesday night in our Bible study, and we were talking about how First Baptist has all these opportunities to to learn, and we have not only Sunday morning services, but We have Bible studies throughout the week. And as a matter of fact, we have Sunday night, Wednesday night, we have a Thursday night Bible study that's just excellent. And um, we we just have different opportunities, women's Bible studies. Those are all great. But the most important kind of study is an individual Bible study. It's an individual time that each person has spending with God through scripture learning through scripture, study, but also in prayer. That is the most important thing that everyone could do. All this other stuff's good, but the most important thing is one person getting with the one God. There's more that comes out of that than anything else. We must be prepared We must listen and obey his instructions. And then it says, we must tell the message. Recite the message over and over and over again. The next generation must know the message. The next generation cannot go without God's word being heard. That's where we've messed up. That's where my generation has messed up is that the message has not been recited. 
over and over and over again. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to take the blame. My generation should take the blame for not giving the message. Now, anybody else can take the blame, that's fine, but my generation, I blame for not giving the message. We have wavered on the message. We must stand on God's word and keep giving it. It is not a time to waver. And then, finally, a manly man trusts in God's plans, even when it doesn't make sense. God has a plan for everybody. God has a plan for every church. God has a plan for every person. His plan is greater than anything else we can imagine. I don't get it. I want to stand here and tell you, I don't get his plans. It doesn't make a bit of sense to me. But the great thing is, it does to him. My brain does not understand his infinite brain. But it's awesome that everything makes sense to him. And he has the plan that is greater than anything that I can come up with. It doesn't matter if we're a man or a woman or if we're a kid or whatever. God's plan is better. And if we're going to trust in him, then we need to trust him. And we're going to trust in him in everything. Not just in the things that we choose to trust him in. You know, little things here and there. I'm going to take this, God, and you take that. You know what I'm saying? God's plan is greater. If we're willing to be people of God, then we need to be people of God. Right? Now, here's the truth. I want to confess to you. That's hard. That's really hard. And I would love to tell you, stand here and tell you that I got it under control. I know how to do it. It's hard. And every day it's a battle. Try to let go. What's the phrase? Let go and let God? That's hard. But God brings the blessings when he is the one that's in control. Yeah, it's hard. But we must sacrifice to give it to him. Life is more at peace when we give things to the Prince of Peace. Amen?